pacing I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted, stay humble Now wake up! It's time to look at the enemy Hi everybody, Ricky here from Behind the Bars TV And today's guest is Lewis Raymond Taylor He's the owner of a £25 million business and today he's going to share his story with us about how he got to where he did now. So, Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to diving deep, obviously, uh, on a subject I'm very familiar with. So, where whereabouts are you at now? Are you living in Bali? I'm living in Bali in Indonesia, yeah. So, four years ago, I uh, started, well, five, six years ago, I started my business and... Um, quickly realized that I could do it from anywhere in the world. It was online good life coaching, which we'll get on to. Um, and I started traveling and Bali out of every place I've been to. I've lived in Dubai for a bit and I've floated around various places. But Bali for me is the uh is, is the paradise. It's got a little bit of Western culture. So you got all nice cafes and stuff like that. Nice good gyms, premium stuff. But then you've also got that lovely chilled east, southeast vibe uh, yeah. where you can just lie in a hammock and go sunbathing and stuff like that which you don't get in the UK especially not at the moment I hear. Oh, it's absolutely freezing here at the minute minus five <laughs> oh, fuck. so Lewis what we'll do is we'll uh, go back to the start so where did you where were you born and where did you grow up so I was born in Hertfordshire uh, in Kings Angley which is just outside Watford which is just outside North London um, for people who are local and non-local um and uh my dad was an alcoholic and he'd put me down a lot. Um he'd literally call me a, a stupid buffoon, that's what he used to call me, and uh tell me I'd never amount to anything. And there were a few times where he'd hit me. It's not like he came in every night with a belt, but yeah, he definitely physically hit me probably at least five times. And I just grew up feeling like a bad kid. And um from the age of well, like five, six years old, I was already starting to play up. Like in nursery, that was the first time I have had a memory from my mum. She told me that when I was like a naughty kid, you know, she came into to a nursery as a, as a come and see your child in nursery day. And all the kids are sitting down quietly on the carpet and there's me banging a drum singing happy birthday, like in a, on my own. Yeah. Right, there's this always just a little bit off key, basically. Um and then I felt like I wanted this love from my dad, but I didn't get it. Um so I started to explore being an actor. So I wanted to be an actor. Right. So I used to do these like plays. My mum even got me into like a it's a stage school, but it's a weekend acting class, basically, called Stagecoach. Actually, I should have mentioned the name probably. But oh well. And um, yeah, a guy sexually sexually abused me at the age of about ten or eleven. And I, I don't know if that had anything to do with it. You know, I've, I've gone back and I've pieced all the trauma together and yeah. sort of realised that there's definitely been some indicators and some red flags there but i don't know if that particularly um is a good excuse or not as to what i did uh or even a justification uh or even an influence but it definitely happened and then i stopped all the acting and singing and dancing that was giving me that significance that i needed at the time you know i, I wanted love from my dad didn't get it didn't feel like i got it my mum was practically providing for me, but she was really emotionally disconnected. So she didn't really show me much love or tell me she loved me or hugged me much so, or at all that I can remember. Probably happened, but I can't remember it. So I felt a bit unloved and bad uh, and naughty um, from up until 10. And then I reached secondary school and it was like, right, I can create a new identity for myself. It wasn't going through my head at the time as specific as this, but I looking back on it, and I started to be the bad lad, and I had an ASBO at fourteen, so obviously an ASBO. I don't know if you've got an international order, uh, an international audience, but it's an antisocial behavioural order, 
where you're like banned from the public area and you've got curfew and that, that's this from 14 so and they they 15, give you that as a bit of a deterrent don't they give you like an osborne to try and on, say, say that again mate sorry the try they give you that as try to give you a bit of a deterrent don't they see so like you give you an osborne before yeah. it leads on to further things yeah yeah well there was basically that's basically i was just a menace what i was doing was to get attention. I didn't realize it at the time, but I'd go out and smash windows and like light fires and shoplift, and it'd be shoplifting for the sake of it. I'd be shoplifting like makeup for the girls I was with or whatever, you know. And um, I'd nick the bus hammer from the back of the bus. You know the bus hammers they got with the little diamond the tip. Hammers, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She'd nick them and then she'd go around just smashing every bus stop window. Like I'd walk four miles between one town and to the next, and I'd just smash every window on the way through. I don't know why. I think I was just, I think any attention, wherever it's, whether it's uh, positive or negative, is attention, right? And I think that's what I was looking for. Anyway, 15 I was expelled from school. For refusing to accept the authority of staff, and I've got I, I did a documentary about myself recently, and I went through old school papers. My mum kept them all, every single letter, and going through them, it's bizarre. Um, they said I should seek psychiatric uh, assessments. Uh, they said I was troubled. They said I was saying like very um like crazy things. Like once I shouted out in assembly, all girls are lesbians. Like. Yeah. This is crazy shit, right? <laughs> Obviously, I don't condone that to this day, as I was a twelve-year-old, thirteen-year-old boy, or whatever. Um, and in the end, uh, there was one letter where it was like, I, I find it funny, and I shouldn't, but obviously, I've still got this part of me. But it was I was reading the letter, and it said, "Mr. Manning," because that's who it was. <clears throat> Mr. Manning was dealing with another student who had got himself into trouble. And Lewis took it upon himself, having 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 nothing to do with the situation whatsoever, to come and stand in front of Mr. Manning's face and cause an unnecessary confrontation. So I was, just, I was a little bit loopy, I think, right? Yeah. And um, I was expelled from school, then drink, drink, drugs, started to get in my life a bit and uh the first significant well no not the first but the the next significant trauma was uh i got into a relationship and when i was 17 i was in this relationship for a year and at the time that felt like a long time you know it was like when you're young like a year is a long time and uh i kind of thought oh maybe i can be lovable maybe i'm not so bad you know and uh, and then one night she she told me we got in an argument. She told me she cheated on me, and it literally just broke my heart. And I just felt rejected. I felt lost. I felt everything from that had happened in my family as well. Because up until this point, just before my family had said they're infants to me, because I kept on affecting my younger brother. Like I was selling drugs as well. I had my little younger brother selling drugs for me stupid stuff and then they were saying we're gonna cut you off so you just come in you go to your bedroom you don't get no dinner you know i just felt overwhelming loss and i smashed the kitchen up pulled out a drawer like ripped everything out and then a six inch kitchen knife fell on the floor and i picked it up and i just went and i just slashed both sides of my neck and you're actually clipped an artery um and uh, and then and then I started to try and fight the paramedics, <laughs> and, and then uh, they 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 finally uh, police arrested me, take me to the hospital, pin me down, stitch me up, and then I ripped all the cannulas out and went back up to her house. And then the police arrested me under the mental health uh, section, being under the mental health uh, act. So that's my first uh, chapter. I'll give I'll give you a chance to. <laughs> To, uh, to to get a word in, but that's, that, that, that's, that's up that's up to um, yeah eighteen. So were you um obviously when you're done that were you when you cut your own throat and stuff were you on drink and drugs then? Not drugs, just drink at that point. Just whiskey. Whiskey used to turn me a little bit loopy. If I drank too much whiskey, I'd just black out and yeah, 
I didn't mean to kill. Oh, I don't think it was a suicide attempt. I think it was an impulsive yeah. seeing moment. I just literally picked it up, and before I knew it, I was like, I can imagine that's what happens when you kill someone, right? Yeah. You just like you you see red, you stab them, they're dead. You're like, fuck, what the what have I done? You know, um, it was like that, but to myself. So, um, so it seems yeah. like obviously growing up with the things that have happened to you, with the like with your dad not feeling mm. much love at home. That's what happens, isn't it? You go out and you're looking for attention because you just want, even if it's bad attention, you just want to be noticed, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And that's what happened after that because up until actually, up until that point, my when my dad used to hit me, he used to pin me down, be on top of me, big guy, six foot. I mean, I'm six foot two now, so I'm actually a bit taller than him. But he was six foot, I'm a little kid, big, like your sort of size but not sort of muscle more sort of fat but anyway you're a big big bulky guy but anyways a big guy on top of me and i remember looking up just thinking i could i can't hit you back because i don't want to hit you back because you're my dad i love you and then that must mean that you don't love me and that was like when i drew that conclusion and i felt very powerless felt very you know like fight flight or freeze kind of thing i would freeze and then but I was the gobby, I was um, I was Larry, I would, you know, I had a lot of balls. So I always used to get into fights, but I used to just let them beat me up. I used to just literally let them kick me down to the floor and kick my head in and then just get back up and laugh. And, you know, that was that. Like you were <laughs> Yeah, I didn't give a shit. Right. I just, yeah, it didn't bother me. And then I came to when I was 18, some point during my, when I was 18, I saw one of the guys in a nightclub nightclub that had uh that had uh jumped me with a few of his mates a few weeks before because we was up to all sorts at this point and then um i basically the same you know the involuntary convulsion i sort of told you about where i put, picked up the knife and sliced my throat the same thing happened but i punched him in the face i didn't mean to didn't think about it i just walked up to him recognized him and just punished him in the face for the first time in my life it's quite weird for a 18 year old boy in my sort of world to have had his first punch thrown at 18 you know yeah. usually it's going to be at 11 or 12 or something you know but i felt i would just let people beat me up anyway had a scrap got kicked out by the bouncers and felt like fucking mike tyson you know like i had got my power i was like yes <laughs> it gave me something that i'd never felt before and it gave me that significance that I was looking for. I now can I now can track it back. Like it's like I wanted love for my dad. I didn't get that. So I tried to get it in significance through acting. Didn't get that because I got sexually abused. So I started to get into trouble to get attention. Wasn't getting enough attention. Started got into a fight. And then oh, and now I was like, oh well done, Lewis. You knocked that geezer out, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I loved God. it. Loved it. So I I thrived off that. So then I start started. No, no word of a lie, probably fighting twice a night. Like, only on the weekends. I'm not talking like going out deliberately. Well, I did go out deliberately looking for a fight, but not like <clears> doing the <throat> But on the weekends, I'd go into the nightclubs, fueled up with gear, fueled up with coke, yeah. go into the clubs, go looking for a fight, looking for someone to fucking look at me for longer than a second to go, what the fuck are you looking at? And then, and then, and then let's have it. I would sometimes even have my clothes ripped off me. And then I would go outside, find a homeless person, buy their clothes off them, put them on, get back in the queue, get back in the get in, get back in, have another fight. <laughs> I'd fight with bouncers. Um, I mean, this is not me telling more stories and trying to make myself look like a big man because I know you had some serious, serious criminals. I'm, I'm, I'm not a career criminal. I'm not a big man. I never was. But I was hanging around. Obviously, telling your story and how how you're in. Yeah. You know what I mean, but obviously, you can see the way you're telling your story. A lot of it stemmed from the way you're brought up, and that's what happens if you're brought up like that. People don't understand when you're brought up in these yeah. sort of environments that affect you in later life, and that's why you're at these ways. Mm, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't, I don't say it to sound like a bad man, but I just went on a, this sort of self sabotage mission where I kind of wanted to be beaten up. I used to like jump into groups of fights and just let them just know that I was going to lose, but just wanted to lose. And, and I used to start, I, I, I worked abroad in Magaluf and I and Apple and I used to get, like, I got, had, a, had fights with mafia and all sorts of things, right? 
I knew they were mafia, still wanted to fight them. Knew that they were the biggest drug dealer in Cyprus, still wanted to fight them. Oh. I just had, I had a, got slashed in the back, broke my jaw, had my two front teeth knocked out, all sorts of shit happened over the years. I just, I think, I think I was trying to kill myself, basically. Self destruction. To what it's yeah, complete, like. complete self destruction. But at the same time, I was also getting fed this. Oh my god, look, did you hear what Lewis did last night? And our oh, Lewis legend, he said we did with that. So that 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 um, mafia guy, you know, is and I was la- is, is the only fuel of significance that I had in my life. So I had to, so I had to keep on receiving that in order to feel complete. Without that, I felt I had nothing. That was my character and my identity was this crazy guy. Um. Yeah. Um. So, what were you doing when you were working a weir in Cyprus and stuff? Were you just? Well, I was supposed to be working, but I t- didn't end up working most of the time. I used to try working in bars, like getting people into the bars, but I'd get sacked and just not turn up. And yeah, it was a shambles. I was pretty much eating out of like tourists, like plates of cheesy chips, like that you like picking out. <laughs> <laughs> like, not not far off homeless, but um. I came back from all that, from two years of doing that, nearly died so many times. Even my friend told my ex-girlfriend when she came out to, on holiday one year, he said, before you go home, make sure you say goodbye to Lewis because he ain't coming home. And they were dead serious about that. He's like, he's going to die. I used to swing from balconies as well, like major high balconies, like pissed out of my absolute fucking nuts and swing from balcony to balcony like it was a joke oh, just like yeah i had a death wish um anyway i came back and, and by this point um yeah all sorts of other stuff had happened i'd walked in and found my dad dead that was something that happened that was traumatic um from his alcohol abuse he got well i think it was that he got a uh, pancreatic cancer and then ended up dying um oh, then was 21 so how did you that, how did you feel when you after that? Numb, just numb. Didn't feel anything. Oh, there's and um, this is another big part of my story actually. When I was eighteen, uh, not when I was eighteen, between the ages of eighteen and twenty one, I'd I got four GBH and one ABH on my record, but somehow I was out on bail still. Um, even though I'd already been in the young offenders, so I'd, I went to young offenders institution at YOI eighteen. So I went oh, to right. Honesty and Woodhill. Um, Just and then I got into that bit, Lewis, obviously, because obviously yeah. they always like to hear about the main yeah, yeah. They yeah, yeah. like to hear about the prison story. So what happened for your first time in prison in the YUIs? What happened there then? Well, they put me in fucking Woodhill, uh, double A cat, two uh, A, which was full of absolute violent, murdering. Like, yeah, there's one guy in there that was top of the wing at the time. We're not at the top of the wing, but everyone would talk about him. I googled his name when he came out, and he was he, he was in there for stabbing a midwife to death thirty times. I was like, those are the sort of people I was knocking around with, you know. And how um, old were you at that point? Eighteen. Eighteen. So, what was your thoughts when you were in that wagon on the way to prison? Was there any fear, oh, or were you just excited? Yeah, there's a bit of excitement there. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. It's a, it's a mixture of fear, anticipate, anticipation, excitement, but also notorious. Yes, I'm. I say like I'm, I'm. I'm progressing in my, you know, in the way that I want. I thought my life had to go. Um. So yeah, it was a weird thing. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't upset about it. It was. Um. It was a mixture of feelings, but I was. Um. But yeah, it, it did have some scary moments in there. Won't lie. You know, you have to fight when you're in there. When when yeah. those young offenders, it has to come a point where you have to have a fight, or you're just gonna look like a fucking pussy, and you can get taken advantage of, and you're in real trouble. Um. So yeah, <laughs> there's a few hairy moments there. Then they moved me to Onley, which was I can't. I don't even know where that is in the country, but that was a lot. A lot, a lot better. So how long um, were you on the first one? Not long at all. Not long at all. Just uh, three months. I did three because months. Right. Three, stole two, a van. Stop. Yeah, stole a van. Smashed it up. Had a police chase. Had a bit of weed on me. That was it. Yeah. Got recalled to prison. Did another month. Um. 
for breaching my probation for not doing the community order that I had to do. Because I was just like, fuck you, I'm not doing anything you want me to do. Um, and then, yeah, criminality and everything just progressed. So the, the violence progressed, the drugs progressed. I was selling drugs. I was taking drugs a lot. It, it turned out I wasn't in the nightclubs anymore. I was in the flats and the kitchens and the three-day benders in a row without eating or sleeping or drinking water. And so it was just like alcohol and coke four days sometimes. Like It's just crazy. So what and, uh, was it at the time? Was it ecstasy and cocaine, I'd imagine? Co I... Cocaine, pretty much, yeah. It was pretty much my bread. Well, and also uh, methadone. I don't know. If you... No, methadrone, sorry, not methadone. Uh, meth you know, like the MCAT, the um, oh, right, yeah. eye that came out at the time. He was probably inside at that point, but it was, was like st stronger than coke. It was the legal and, high at the time, wasn't it? Legal, high the legal yeah, yeah. <laughs> illegal. Yeah, so we was in lap it up and then when it went legal, this is what got me into drugs. This is what got me into certain drugs, actually. When it went legal, I was like, I'm still going to sell this because this stuff's good and I'm going to make some money off it. And the fact it went legal, everyone stopped being able to get it. So I started selling it. I even had flyers. I had leaflets. I used to give out leaflets in the pub for uh, buying it. And then after, after that sort of phased out, it turned into coke. Anyway, loads of stuff happened in the middle, but we're trying not to this to be too long. But yeah. the the major incident that happened was um when I was twenty four years old, I was in a jumped I jumped the taxi ranks, so I jumped to the front because I was so pissed I just didn't realise what I was doing, just sort of jumped in the car and then realised there was a massive queue behind me after some guy kind of started shouting in my face or whatever. And um Still to this day, I can't remember the guy's face because all I can think of is my dad's face. So I know that my dad triggered, like he triggered my dad in me. Like it was like my dad was back, like yeah. shouting at me all over again. No excuse whatsoever. I still take responsibility for it, but I just want to try and explain why people do some of these things. I mean, there were times where I was going out just to fight, but that particular occasion... He just so happened to trigger me and I, I swung the first punch and missed. Swung the second punch and hit him and he went flat down on his face, um, knocked out cold. And then I saw a, like a slow, thick, dark trickle of blood come out of his head. It just looked like he'd been literally shot in the head. And, um, well, I guess not shot, but... Uh, smashing the head with a hammer or something you know it was like i thought i'd killed him um i was outside Watford junction police station uh, Watford junction um train station so the camera was literally bang on me right there so i was just like waited for the police because i knew that i was going to get banged up for it and um yeah they said you would have got three uh, gbh for that um I'd, I, I'd already had a gbh before um for hitting someone with a bottle Oh yeah, fuck God, I missed the whole, whole the whole thing. Yeah. At one point I was on trial for GBH for four GBHs and a fray. It got dropped down in the end to one GBH, two ABH and a fray through my solicitor. And I got a huge three year, uh, two year, sorry, probation order where I had like 250 hours community service, couldn't be drunk in a public place for 18 months, suspended sentence and all this sort of stuff. I don't know how I got it, but I just managed to get away with it. And actually got through that and had a girlfriend at the time. And girlfriends always gave me that stability to be able to, I was still, I was still getting into trouble, but I was keeping it under the radar. So was that anyway, the incident in the queue? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was kind of like young offenders institution. Then it was just like real severe violence. Then it was, my solicitor said to me, you're looking at a minimum of eight years. And, oh yeah, this is what I was going to say. Like when 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 that happened, they send you for a pre-sentence report. You all know that probation sends you for a pre-sentence report. Well, the court does. You go to probation and they recommend what sort of sentencing you're going to get. They sent me for a psychiatric assessment because they told me you're looking at eight years in prison. And I was like, yeah, okay. So what else? And they were like, you're looking at eight years in prison. I said, like, yeah, I don't care. So what? And they they just thought something was wrong with me. 
So they sent me for a psychiatric assessment because I had no empathy, no remorse, no guilt, no consequence, no like understanding of consequences. And they they sent me for a psychiatric assessment, and I was diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder. And I think that eighty percent of uh, prisons population have anti so have some form of personality disorder. I don't, know, I don't know if you have one by any chance, do you, or if you've been diagnosed? But never been diagnosed, not. Right, you probably have though. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, essentially, what that is though, it was like, ooh, got it. And it's a psychopath, but it, it's actually a psycho. That at its like most extreme end, it's a psychopath. But then, when you look at all this, like the um, the symptoms of it, I guess you could call all the characteristics of it, it's me to an absolute T. Um, so I diagnosed with that a few years. A few years later, I was diagnosed with bipolar type 2 and I was given antipsychotic medication. And then whilst I was in jail once, I was diagnosed with uh, emotionally unstable personality disorder. So I've had three different mental health diagnoses throughout the time. Anyway, I've jumbled that about a bit, but let's go back to when I was 24 and I hit that guy. Um, I got sentenced for GBH. This is my second GBH at this time. Probation, probation officer recommended me for an IPP the first time. We had a quick conversation offline before that, but that's an inde indefinite public protection order. Um, and luckily, the, the court didn't pass it because I could always I could always put a suit on and I could always look like a good good white boy. Do you know what I mean? And I used to, I used to always be able to get away with quite a lot in court, to be honest, um, which is completely unfair. Um, don't mean that with any disrespect by any means. But what I mean is, you know, when a judge saw me and they saw my history on paper, they could kind of give a bit of leniency towards me, I think. Um, but anyway, so I had these other charges. And then I went to uh, court for this time. This this uh, And at this point, I had 10, 10 convictions and nine, no, 10, 10 convictions and 19 charges at this point. And um, I got sentenced to GBH uh, without intent. And they recommended me this time for an EPP, which was uh, a different type of e IPP they changed it to. Like an extended license, isn't it? That's it, that's it. But they didn't pass it again. So, And they even said, we were going to give you three years because you pleaded guilty at the scene. We're going to give you 18 months. And I thought... I've got a touch. I've never heard of that. I know you get a third off for pleading guilty, but I pleaded guilty at the scene. They gave me half off. So I got 18 months for GBH, which um, was, I think, uh, less than what I should have got, to be honest. The, uh, the guy was in a coma for three days, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so the guy was in a coma for three days. And uh, so I like, think he's... Very think, lucky just to get 18 months off in your... <laughs> Very, very lucky, considering I had GBH or an ABH and, and all sorts of means prison before. Like, I could have got five years, six, wow. eight more. I could have got the EPP or the IPP. I ended up becoming a, ma a mapper, um, which is a multi-agency public protection order. I don't know if you know much about that, but I was a mapper. So I was a dangerous individual in society or public and one to be watched or something. So that's the criminality pretty much all out the way. So you got any questions about any of that? So obviously when you've went into prison on that, was that your last time when you got the year? Yeah, years? yeah, yeah. But no, so the 24 years old was when I got the 18 months. Yeah, that was the, that was yeah. the last time. So yeah. That was the last time. So what was, what changed for you then in that sentence and what was different? Did you, yeah. when you went in, you had your 18 months, obviously you had a bit of a longer time to think about things this time. Yeah. Did you reevaluate your life and realize what you were doing to other people? Not to other people, selfishly. It was actually more my, myself, and it was an immediate sort of wake up call, actually. Um, I wrote to my friend and asked him what they'd been saying about me on social media, you know, because I love, I actually kind of like half of me wanted to see if people were calling me a scumbag or whatever, and I didn't want to hear that. Yeah. I kind of wanted to see, like, ah, look, Lewis has got sent to jail, you know. So I don't know, I sort of fed off that stuff, like I said, you know. So I wanted to know what they were saying. Um, they said, you're on the front page of the paper. One one of them called me a thug. One of them called me a, a boorish and violent, which I had to find out what meant, which meant you're a pig, basically. 
Um, yeah. yeah, troubled, troubled teen, all this sort of stuff. Um, not teen. That was in the paper recently. Travel team becomes millionaire, whatever it was. But yeah, the all sorts of headlines went across a couple of papers, a couple of local magazines and stuff. So were you? So they don't care about that. So, sir? so were you? Were you thriving off them sort of headlines when you were that age? No, not really. I didn't. Didn't, didn't give a shit. Really, I was like whatever. Yeah, cool. What else is said? And they said your friend has put a picture of you outside courtroom the day you were sentenced. And also outside the courtroom, the day you were sentenced seven years before, the exact same courtroom, and it was St Albans uh, Crown Court. Um, and you wrote above it a caption: "Nothing changes." And and this was coming from a guy that was like on my level as well, and he, as in same sort of criminality. In fact, he's actually still on now. He's in jail now, and he's like way worse, but. Um, but he had told he of all people said nothing changes and I was thinking oh, he's right nothing has changed in those seven years I had tried to make a few changes but they were, they were always outside of myself they was like I'm going to stop hanging around with them people I'm going to I'm going to only get on the gear on the weekend I'm, you know all, all those sort of stupid changes that you think are going to make a difference in your life but don't make no, no changes whatsoever and then I realized if I wanted my life to change, I had to change myself. And I know that's obvious now, but I just, I never even thought about it. I didn't think someone like me could change. I thought other people could change or there was other types of people, but me, people like me couldn't change, especially because my dad told me I was bad. Um, the school told me I was bad. The community told me I was bad. The uh, prison system told me I was bad. Probation told me I was bad. The psychiatric assessment said I was bad. My ex girlfriend said I was bad. Everyone told me I was bad. I'm bad. I can't change. But for some reason, it clicked that I could. And I was an addict through and through, like everything I've been addicted to drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, you know, anything. Even to this day, I find myself in addictive behaviors that are more constructive like business or gym or something like that. Um, but I just got latched on to the idea of changing myself. And I did that inside prison. So I went to uh, Bedford Prison. Then I went to uh, Peterborough. And then I finally went to the Mount. Um, and when I resettled in the Mount, because that was closest to home, that was when they started allowing me. That was like cat C at that point. It, like, it was like from a... I think it was from like a B to a B to a C. And then at that point, I could start doing maths and English classes and rehabilitation programs and go to the gym. All the other all the other jails were 23 hours a day, bang up. This one was like completely different. Yeah. Um, and I just utilized all the services. I started to try to change my life and I made a decision that I was going to change my life. And uh, during this Rehabilitation of Addictive Prisoners Trust program called RAPT program, I don't know if you've heard of that. No, I've not heard I did, of that. did a six-week RAPT program. And it was real basic personal development, like how do you feel? Like, And we're like, I'm all right. That's, that's what everyone said, I'm all right. You know, I'm hungry. And then you start to, they give you, they gave us a sheet with a list of emotions on there and you start like, looking through it and oh, I guess I'm a little bit frustrated today you know we started really basic stuff you know because I'd never had my emotions developed at all you know my mum and dad never took the time to allow me to explore those emotions so I don't think I've ever developed them or ever had them I don't know um but um I got I got some made some progress and I was like wow this works and then there was this guy that came into this wrapped program and he was from a rehab and he was he was like if you if you want you can apply for this scholarship thing this grant and you can go into a, like a six-month rehab program after prison and I was first of all I was like now nah, I'll be fine you know but then I did, did this maths and English test and I before I did did the test 
And this is functional skills one and two. So we're talking about a year 10, 10 year old level maths and English. I punched a wall because I was so scared of the test. And because um, I was just scared of like proving my dad wrong of being this buffoon and all this sort of stuff, right? And um, you all know this, but yeah, you, they, they just took me to the hospital and a bloody taxi with one police officer when they handcuffs it wasn't anything special but anyway I was in in the taxi and um they they drove past right where I was from like my area and I could see out the window <clears throat> and I saw out the window and I just felt everything come back like it was like I had made no changes it was like it was the same old me and I knew that the moment I got released I was going to go straight back into the pubs straight back into the, doing whatever I was doing and I was going to get myself in the same situation over and over again. So I decided to apply for that uh, rehab and it was £20,000 and I got it. They gave it to me and um, went down to Portsmouth. They literally picked me up from the prison gate, took me down to Portsmouth and put me in a six months fully intensive rehabilitation treatment centre. And uh, I'll tell you what, that's worse than jail. I don't know if you've been to rehab before, but um, 24-hour therapy, you know, in prison, bang up, you know, you can sit down there, watch TV and chill out. But there, they break you down. It was uh, it was a tough time, but it was needed. I'll give you another I'll give you another chance to speak, mate. Sorry, mate. <laughs> I, know about I know my story so well now that I just <laughs> flow with it. I don't even need, need, need yeah. the questions. I'm just letting you uh, obviously tell your story because obviously that's what you're here for. But um, so obviously you made prison work for you on the last time because there's not many people do, but there is a lot of things on offer in prison, like you've mentioned, isn't there? Like doing yeah. to better yourself. Yeah. Well, obviously when you've come out of prison that time, did you think to yourself, this is it, this is me finished with prison, I'm going to make something of my life? Obviously, that's why I went into the rehab. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of made that decision really early on. And I'm very intensive, very impulsive, very committed, but usually in the wrong areas, you know. Um, but this one, luckily, I, you know, focused in on the right area. And, um, yeah, I fully dedicated myself to change. Like, I stopped connecting with all of my old friends, like every single one of them. Um, changed my name in a way. Like, my name's actually Lewis Taylor, but I started using my middle name and now call myself Lewis Raymond Taylor, which just felt different. My dad's name, incidentally, maybe some weird stuff going on there, I don't know. But but anyway, I call myself Lewis Raymond Taylor now, and that felt different. So I created a new identity. Um, And, it, yeah, I, I went to this six-month program. They broke me down. They built me back up really helped and then I started doing AA and NA meetings one a day two a day three a day sometimes just to just to keep myself not like going back into a pub because although that doesn't seem like much obviously it starts with a pub and then it's then it then it, then it's the gear then it's a scrap and it's back in jail you know and that happened that can happen in two hours <laughs> so um so were you working at the time when you were in the rehab place or were you just f- focusing on that no, no, you're not. You're not allowed to leave. It's like oh, prison. In there yeah. for the full yeah. six months. Well, the first three months you're not allowed to leave, and in the next three months they take you go into, um, like a dry house where you're in a house with other addicts, and then you go to the centre during the day. So it's like three months live in, and then three months still live in, but you get to have a bit of freedom. And that was the moment where I could have kind of been institutionalised for like at this point. Yeah, nearly a year and a half. Not a long time, obviously, compared to, to you and a lot of other people. But to see, like, the pubs and the people outside smoking a bag, drinking pints, like, walking past them, being like, the fuck am I doing walking to an AA meeting to a church hall at fucking 25 years old? It was psychological trauma to have to just, just keep on steering myself away, knowing that I could go and get myself around a nice load of girls or... yeah all that stuff it was just and then yeah there was one time where i was um i was i'm gonna go in the pub i I went to go and get a chinese takeaway i was walking back and i saw these people having the time of their life and i thought i can go in there there's nothing stopping me from going in there i'm allowed to (laughs) i said i'm gonna go in 
and one leg was going forward, but I swear to God, another leg was stepping me back and going, no, you're not. Like, it, it was that, it was, it was a, a physiological, mental, step forward, step back. I'm going in, no, I'm not, I'm going in, no, I'm not. And I ended up throwing the Chinese, right, in the air oh. and running back to my house. That, and, that, and then that was the time where I first won the real strong battle hard with myself. Yeah, and it's through doing that more and more and more that I've been able to control my impulses and uh, and things like that. So, yeah, rehab helped me. AA and NA helped me a lot, and then I started to do volunteer work, uh, which made me feel good. And I was like, "Wow, that's interesting. I never never considered doing something like that before." Um, and then I remember from rehab and from AA and NA. There's basically just so much learning in that in in that environment. It's unbelievable. It's like condensed and it's life changing material. Um, they have to get as deep as they could possibly get to save people's lives. Because actually, whilst I was in rehab, some guy strung himself up with his shoelaces and hung himself on the landing. Well, not the landing, but on the stairs in in the rehab. You know, it's that you know that that tough and um i was absorbing it all i was absorbing the breakthroughs the, the relapses the stories the trauma i was just listening to all in these group sessions and then when i sort of finished doing not finished but had done that for a few months i started to help random people i used to literally go online see a miserable person and say do you want to meet out for a coffee and sit down and help them and then I realized I got some great results. Like I said, I said, oh, all right, I, well, not, I didn't get them great results straight away, but they, it was helpful. And I said, okay, well, I'll meet you every week for the next six weeks. And then I did that. And at the end of the six weeks, we noticed all the results they had in their life. And then it was at that point where I started Googling and just sort of finding out coaching and thought, oh, well, maybe I could do this. And I shared my story online had a few inbound inquiries people saying i really resonate with your story i'd like to work with you blah, blah. and then yes eight seven to eight months later i built a six-figure business just from taking in one-to-one -one clients at, you know a couple of grand ago for three months and um that's, that's just getting back to that because obviously i don't really know much about your business side of it yeah well you went from doing, like you say, just meeting up with people, and that's how you started your business off. Yeah. Did you have a name for your Yeah, business? yeah. Well, actually, well, actually, I was on ESA, so I was on employment support allowance. I was on housing benefit because I I got out of the clean and dry house into my own flat, but it was you know I worked. literally they were like heroin addicts passed out in on the on the corridor to get to get to my flat. So I was in. And I used to have to like cycle to the laundrette with my bloody bag of clothes between my handlebars, you know, starting out real at the beginning, yeah. humbly. But then realized I had this knowledge to share that people wanted to pay for. And I also realized I knew how to use the internet and social media to get the clients and put it together. And all, all, all coaching is, is delivering a helpful session on Zoom. And at the time that didn't exist, it was Facebook video, but... That's all it was. And I was charging people. I didn't even have a business. They put it straight in my account. It was only 18 months later where I got an account and sorted it all out. But I was I was just like, yeah, give me the money and I'll help you. Give me the money and I'll help you. And it was just a hustle at the time, really. But it wasn't it wasn't in a malicious or a, yeah. a um, it was just I want to start a business here, but I don't really know how to do it. So I'm just going to make it a bit messy and take the money and help people. And build was it, it like a sort of counseling session, what you were doing? Well, it was coaching. So I did go and do some training um, online and coaching is essentially asking questions. So you ask people challenging and thought provoking questions that allow them to uncover the answer themselves. So, you know, you might say something as little as what makes you feel happy, you know, and then go, well, I guess these things. OK, when was the last time you did those things? Well, not very long, a long time ago. Did you find the time to do any of the things this week? I guess on Wednesday I could. We'll do that then. You know, that's that's like yeah. coaching in this absolute basic form, right? But then 
I started to learn more and more and more and get better and better and better and better. And I partnered with other people as well and uh, hired people in the business as the business was growing. Um, and then I had tons of coaches coming to me saying, Lewis, because I, cause I, I did my functional skills in prison, one and two, which gave me the, the qualifications I need to do an access course in college, which was a one-year course to get me into uni, which I did. And then I got into university. In between that university, there was this three-month gap, you know, like summer, you know, summer holidays. And I went traveling around Thailand, um, Cambodia, Vietnam. I oh, know not Vietnam. Five places around Asia, I can't remember. Singapore. Um, yeah, Indonesia, where I'm living now, Bali. I didn't actually get to Bali. I was in, in, in the city. Anyway, I went around five places in Asia, but I was still doing my clients. I was, I was doing them face-to-face -face back back then, but I started doing them online when I was doing that. And then I thought, oh, I could, I could do this online all the time. Um, and then I had a load of coaches coming to me saying like, Lewis, because I was leaving, I'm young, I'm 32, I'm quite young looking now, but when I was 25, I was even younger looking, like really young. And um, I had coaches that were 50, 60 years old, you know, saying I've been doing this 30 years and and I've never been able to get anywhere near what you what you've done in the last six months. What are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just doing this, this and this and just shared a few social media things and they just hadn't even tried it and uh, or knew about it and then the business kind of evolved into um helping some coaches build out their business and get the clients which is now rife but at the time wasn't i was one of the first i think and then i i started to realize that people had realized that online was the way to go with a lot of business um thought way before the pandemic so there was loads of these other people doing what I was doing, which was helping coaches grow their business. So I was like, I need to get to them before they get into this place where they're getting, you know, vultured upon by other people. So I partnered up with a guy who qualifies life coaches. So then we then had the whole solution and we could take a normal person, qualify them as a life coach, I help them build their, their business and then we give them basically this whole vehicle and this opportunity to build a freedom-based online business that helps people. And to me, it's a solution that everyone wants. You want, you want to be able to work from anywhere in the world. You want to make serious cash. And if you can help people while you're doing it, it's a bloody bonus. Okay. And we'd found the solution of how to do that. And that's why the business blew up. And we made 400 grand in our first year um 1.6 million in our second year you know and it just fucking blew um so how did, you feel, yeah. how did you feel in going from prison to having all this money and living yeah did you yeah did you live the high life? <laughs> yes a weird one because i feel very detached from my old my old self yeah. it's almost like it's a story i tell of someone else you know and it's like this is just me and who i know now and this other guy is someone that I tell a story about. Um, and I've, I've always been like this. So, so it's kind of weird in a way. I don't know if you can relate to that. Yeah, relate to that, definitely, yeah. Because I'm helping a lot of people myself now. That's, I think, obviously, when you've been in our situation, we, the way you've been, the environment you've been brought up around, and then you go on to inflict violence on other people, because I was doing similar things to what you've mentioned. But now I'm obviously helping people, and it makes you feel good, doesn't it? course yeah and um you completely change your identity you know who you are how you think you know everything um the things you like the clothes you wear the way you speak the people you hang around with it's just like an entirely new life um so it it's it's yeah it's difficult to sort of compare the two because they, they don't feel like they're connected sometimes but I'm very grateful I'm in the position I am now. We have, um, we've trained over 5,750 uh, life coaches. 
Uh, we've got a community that spans 80 countries around the world. Um, we've built an app. We've also got um, a app on Oculus headset um, where you can do virtual reality coaching. So you can go in as a digital avatar and yeah, yeah we're really trying to, yeah, take, take coaching into the 21st century it's been archaic for a long time with women on chaise long chairs you know asking you how you feel with a notepad and pen but it can be a little bit more new age than that and that's what we're trying to work on so was um, was a lot of your clients like obviously wealthy people that just needed help a bit of a mixture at the beginning it was a it was a very big mixture um weren't wealthy particularly actually my first client was first client was a millionaire uh so he was wealthy he didn't look it though was that one of those secret ones <laughs> um but um most people were just your average people it was just random things i helped one woman split up with her partner who was uh, in a toxic relationship and she wanted the courage to like you know leave him i helped one lady start up her dream business which was literally a, a dog walking business like but who am i to tell her what her dream is but you know it was like these little random one woman who had this eating disorder um you know she she 10 years struggled with her weight and she was like like skinny as a stick and and then i coached it back to the beginning and we realized that it was because her dad left her when she was younger and she experienced such loss that since then she's she's found control in her life through controlling her diet. It's bizarre. And then she was able to eat a bowl of chips in front of me. So I was having all these like everyday people and I was helping them all with all these things. I realized I either had a bit of a gift for it or I had absorbed so much knowledge through my own personal journey of transforming with my life. And I'm like, ah, yeah, I remember that one. Or, oh yeah, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, or it was yeah. the or it was the rooms, you know, the fellowships, the the AA, the NA, the rehabs, and just absorbing all that information. But I think all of it combined just created the world's best life coaching academy that I could you could ever have, the University of Life kind of thing, you know. And um, yeah, combined with a team of eighty people now, we're we're on yes. a mission, and that's why it's hit the papers, and it's like convicted criminal troubled teen becomes multi-millionaire and all this i've seen you were in the yeah. forbes, forbes magazine weren't you yeah forbes i've been in forbes three times now actually yeah. um yeah uh, and all sorts of the star um um oh, i don't know i was in 36 newspapers in in a month because <laughs> once once one gets hold of it they all just yeah. everyone just copies it all but a massive um, you've made for turning your life around and obviously for what you've done and what you've achieved. It's, uh, it's great to see. Obviously, this is the reason why I do these podcasts, to show people that prison's not the end of the line. It could be the start of your journey, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I'm grateful for all those things. Like, it's it taught me such resilience. Like, sometimes when people are on, well, I don't do coaching personally myself anymore because I'm the CEO of a company. But when, you know, when I used to do coaching, I used to look at people's problems and just think, that's not a fucking problem. <laughs> That's not a fucking problem. It's like they're way worse. And you, know, and you can help people shift their perspective by, you know, not allowing them to stay in that victim mode, not allowing them to live live in that story that's keeping them stuck. And you gain such resilience and strength that if even other tough things happen to you throughout your journey, you can deal with them. And um you just learn a lot, you know, we, we've, there's things that we've learned that people with PhDs don't have, you know, and I, and I know that for a fact, because I have people that are doctors that have PhDs that do my courses. <laughs> so I've actually got the facts of that, but um, absolutely guys, anyone who's listening to this, who's maybe in prison, possibly doubt it, maybe, um, or just come out, and you're in that kind of limbo space. I remember that limbo space. Do I go back? Do I go forward? Do I go back? It's worth it. I remember the, one of the one of the best things I ever did for myself was it was kind of like that battle that I told you about with the Chinese. But it was when I was in rehab, 
Um, I kept on saying to myself, what the fuck am I doing here? But unluckily, they'd, they'd, they'd put it on my bail conditions as my registered address. So if I left, I got recalled to prison. So I was like stuck there, but yeah. I still wanted to leave. And every day when they're like ripping deep into trauma, getting me to like recall everything that's ever happened to me, I would come up with all sorts of stories as to why it's a bad idea for me to be here and I shouldn't be here. And I wrote myself a note, literally a note, when when I was in a good frame of mind, when I was like, oh, no, this is good. I'm getting benefit from this. And I wrote, dear Lewis, you've been here before. You're going to be here again. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. Love the real Lewis. And then I signed it. And then I put that on the wall. And that was my, like, because I couldn't trust my own thoughts because my thoughts kept on fucking me up. So I had to just harness when I was in the right frame of my mind, physically write it down and then go back to that every time I had that battle. And then every time I had that battle with myself, I'm getting out of here, this is stupid, what am I doing here? Because you can trick yourself easy, you know, into thinking you're making the right decision for yourself when it's the complete wrong one. I would go to that piece of paper and I'd sign the note. And it wasn't long before that note had tons of signatures all over it. Um, and I realized that I didn't need to look at the note anymore and I could play that battle myself and decide what was right and what was wrong. But before, I just had one voice, which is I hacked it on. So if you're, if you're listening to this, guys, you, there is the opportunity to change everything about yourself, everything about your life. Um, some of you guys who are lifers obviously do have some restrictions. Um, that doesn't mean you can't live an amazing life you guys that aren't lifers the world's your oyster like i've literally been traveling the world i literally just got back from getting married in barcelona i went on this trip from bali where i lived to um ibiza for a stag do to barcelona to get married to santorini to do a stag do to london to take the missus to the Harry Potter musical in the theatre in the West End and then back to Bali. And now we're moving to Switzerland and Mallorca for the next six months and then Mexico after that. And life couldn't be better. That's and, what I was actually going to ask you. Have you got a nice, a lovely lady by your side, but you've just answered the question. Yeah. So, well, I, I managed to, I was speaking on stage in Barcelona and saw this beautiful looking Venezuelan girl. So she's South American, but she was living in America. So she's got an American accent, but she's got like, um, I don't know if she had it at the time. She must have had it. She had slightly curly hair, very different than the usual sort of woman that you'd see in England. Very beautiful. And um, within three days of knowing her, I was like, stay with me. Let's travel the world together. And she actually quit her job and did. <laughs> and we got married just recently. So three years later. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah, so things are good. Um, there is hope, guys, and you can change no matter how bad you are. Like I know looking at me now, whether this if this is a podcast, you can't see me. You come check me out after. I know looking at me now, I've got blonde highlights in my hair. I look like the sort of person that hasn't done any sort of criminal <laughs> criminality whatsoever. And you're probably thinking, who's he to tell me that I can't change my life? I promise you, I had the thought. There is no way that I could ever change. I might be able to change my behavior. I might be able to not get nicked anymore. Yeah. But I can never change the person I am. I'll always be me. But I have changed me, you know. There's still the essence and the personality of me that still exists that's been consistent throughout. Like I'm still ruthless. I'm still passionate. I'm still addictive. But, but, but I'm entirely different you wouldn't recognize me you know in terms of you know the way that i act and the things that i do and things i say and things that i care about and yeah the person i am so there is hope guys fight for it uh it does take a couple of years as well that's that's another thing to like you you yourself yeah uh, Ricky, have, have had a quick journey um well, if, fair place yeah wasn't really that quick because it was 25 year old when I changed, but I, obviously I got recalled 10 years later. Ah, through circumstances right. that affected me life again, but 
So I have been right. on the journey for a long time, but gotcha. when I went back in, then I've actually changed myself again. Got yeah, got yeah. Yeah, it takes a while. I think that's another thing. Like, be prepared for a bit of a fight. You're not going to be able to change overnight, and there's going to be some battles, and there's going to be some tough times, and there's going to be some limbo where you're sitting in like shit, like not no money, fucking what the fuck am I doing? around people that you think are losers like it's gonna happen and and you're gonna be thinking it's actually better to be a criminal <laughs> i've actually thought that before i thought it's better before than this this is shit i don't want to sit in the church hall doing an AA, AA meeting on a friday night but you do you get through that stage then you create so actually, I was talking about this yesterday. There's these three stages: chaos, control, and flow. So I was so I, I was in chaos, which is like manic, do everything, go crazy. Then I stepped into control, which was to really restrict myself fully, not allow myself to take a touch of drink. I still don't drink or take drugs now, but not allow myself to do anything that could allow myself to slip up. Really really hardcore control of yourself which will feel painful and will be tough but then when you let go of that level of control later on parts of it the parts that aren't sabotaging you will then step into flow and your life can unfold and you'll be on this trajectory in the right direction it's like i always used to say my life was spiraling out of control and now i feel like my life spirals into control you know that's and that's the definition of flow right so if you're in chaos now step into control really be very very vigilant with your behavior do not let anything slip when that one mate of yours four months into your journey of recovery invites you to one birthday party say no like just say fucking no just for a bit stick in control and then when you know you're ready, allow yourself to let go of a little bit of this control. Give yourself a bit of freedom. But by this point, you'll be a different person. Yeah. Then you can step into flow. Momentum will kick in and your life will change. But there is a bit of a limbo sticking spot in the middle where, where it can be quite difficult. Um, you know, obviously, you, you yourself, Ricky, with, I should imagine going to probation probably every week and all sorts can, can be a nightmare and, and it can seem like, oh, I can't be bothered. Or maybe I want to go back inside. Some people might be thinking that's even easier. Um, but there is a better life out there, guys. There is, definitely. But like you see as well, it's all to do with your thinking. If you think positive, positive things come to you, doesn't it? It just seems to keep rolling, doesn't it? Definitely. It's yeah. Hard, as with me and my journey now, like it feels like everything, when you're thinking positive, you're doing good things, everything just comes falling into place. Exactly. Just continue to do the next best good thing you can do for yourself and someone else. Taking one step after the next, after the next, after the next. And before you realize, you'll look back and realize how far you've come to the point where I, I can't even recognize myself. And I'm sure you can't either, Ricky. So, yeah, we're, we're, living, we're living proof that you yeah. don't have to be the statistic of the reoffending. And that if you go to jail, you're statistically speaking to go to back and go back and go back you don't have to do that and there are those services available and way more than than i mentioned i did counseling i did psychotherapy in there um gym the rapt program education like they set me up and they got me into university actually three months into university i dropped out and started my own business but they gave me the resources that i needed to get my life and the benefits like financially to stabilize myself in a new area to get myself from prison into university, drop out and become a millionaire. That route actually exists. You know, like when you're in that victim mindset where you're like, Oh, no one wants to fucking help me. They don't want, there's no help for us. They just leave us by the gutter. They don't care about us. It's not true. They're just choosing not to see it. You know, is that help. There, isn't it? The help is there. You've got, yeah. you've got to see it, see it and take advantage of it. Even in prison, you've got all the different courses. You've got courses that change your mindset. You've got, like you see, English and maths to start from scratch. You've mm -hmm. got everything. If you want to change, you can change. 
Simple as yeah. Exactly. But you got to want it. That's the thing. Yeah. Hope and 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 this is what this podcast is going to do for people. It's going to make people want it. Um, maybe not obviously when they're in prison, but definitely when they first get out and the chances of, of them reoffending is going to be much lower due to you. So well done, man, for what for the work you're doing. Well, what I'll do, I'll put your links in the description. Um, have you got have you got a book? Haven't, but when are you when are you releasing this podcast? It'll be on Sunday, I think. Oh, so it'll be a quick one. Can't yeah. mention the exact book publisher, but I'm having, yeah, I will have a book soon, but I haven't got a book yet. But yeah, I've got a, a book deal on the way. But for the moment, you can just follow me on social media, uh, Instagram, maybe Lewis Raymond Taylor. And my website as well is lewisraymondtaylor.com if you want to check that out. And you've got a YouTube channel as well, haven't you? YouTube channel, it's a bit of a new one. Yeah, and that's Lewis Raymond Taylor. Everything's Lewis Raymond Taylor. So that's actually, I'm actually the only Lewis Raymond Taylor in the world, so I've got a good domain there. One of the uh, and, the business, and the business, actually, a quick shout-out to the business, is The Coaching Masters. So if you've ever thought about becoming a life coach yourself, don't think you've got to be perfect or have the confidence or have the experience. You can start from scratch like I did. You can become your first client and use this as personal development. We'll train you up to become a coach. We'll show you how to build a business and then we'll let you go and live wherever you want in the world. And you can go and do that at thecoachingmasters.com. Brilliant. But it's been, uh, it's been good having you on, Lewis. But you sort of, I always end my podcast with one question, which you've sort of answered before, but that was more to the prisoners. But I always say, like, what would you say to the kids? Because there is some kids watching this. Yeah, to see it, them kids that's going off the rails, going down the yep. we went down. Yep. Yeah. Ninety-nine percent of all the cool kids that you see in school that are doing bad things turn up to turn out to be complete low lives or dead or heroin addicts in train stations. You know, it's not cool for very long. I tell you the ones that are cool, it's the ones that listened in class. It's the ones that got a good education and got a good job, made a load of money and got a good missus because of it, right? So it's it's like when you're in school, you think about is cool equals being naughty, you know. But but they don't they don't end up becoming, you know, it's not a good outcome for those people. You know, some of those people die. You know, I know some of those people that you know, one of my friends was stabbed to death. Um. And then I've also got Anthony Joshua that was in my form at school as well. Who's you know the world champion. You know you decide what direction you go in, you know. But if you start your life fucking things up, you're gonna get on a trajectory where it's gonna continue to get worse and worse. Best thing you can do, whether it's cool or not, is stick to your studies. And learn and get a good education. And even if everyone calls you a geek, and even if even everyone calls you, everyone bullies you, right? This is the smallest period of your life. School happens for like five or six or seven years. But then you've got another 60 years after that that really actually matter. When the the geezer, the 21-year-old geezer that's the stockbroker that's got his Lamborghini in central London because he listened in school, do you think he gives a shit about, you know, the guy that used to uh, call him a geek when that guy's now sitting there on benefits with a uh, fat missus and, you know, all that. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> tr just trying to tell it how it is, you know. Yeah, exactly it's right. not the right path. Like, just we've seen the outcome of... Not even prison, right? That's the worst case scenario. But just of not doing the right thing leads you down a path you don't want to go in. And your perception might be a little bit distorted right now, where you might think that being cool is what all matters and school is all consuming and is it's your whole life. When really it's the very first tiny chapter where I don't, I'm not even in contact with anybody from my school and I'm young. Right. Relatively. I'm not that young, but but I'm relatively young. So I should still be in contact with some people from school. But yeah, I might have a couple of people on Instagram that message me once every six months. But none of that mattered. 
the only thing that would have mattered is if I'd have uh, used that resource to set me up for life. So make the most out of that resource that's available to you. And uh, don't worry about being cool. Don't worry about having to have a fight to look hard. Don't worry about having to have a toke on that joint to fit in with the rest of the lads. Focus on being the geezer that's 21 with a Lamborghini in central London because he got a good job or he started his own business and he set himself up for life because that's what really matters. Absolutely bang on me. That's brilliant. But uh, once again, thanks for having you on, Lewis. No worries, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Champion. Take care, everyone. Take care, guys.